Cool. All right. Um, I tried to say hello to you all as you came in, but I may have missed one or two people who asked you to come in. So, hello. Good morning. Hi. Um, I'm Mike Tolte. I work for Microsoft here in the UK. I'm one of Microsoft's developer and platform team. Um, we do various things around the sort of promotion and adoption and to some extent also marketing of our developer tools, languages, platforms, frameworks. Mostly, at one time, it was really anything that the developer might write code against. But in, in all honesty, that's changed a little bit over time. And we have, we have a pretty clear focus these days, certainly around the, the, the last couple of years and, and this year going forward. Our focus is really in, in three main areas. We have some sidelines, but our main areas is, is Windows apps, Windows phone apps, and cloud. That's really where my team focuses uh, these days. I always put my, my name and address kind of things on these slides, so if you want to mail me after this thing, feel free to mail me. You can always mail me. I saw you at DevWeek, you said this. It turned out to be a downright falsehood. I'm coming to get you, that kind of thing. That's all fine. I, I get a lot of that, so that's all fine. So feel free to do that, and feel very free to find my website, that's just at evansalty.com, and feel free to tweet um, at me, or to me, or whatever the right verb is for tweeting. Feel free to tweet at me. And during the session's fine, after the session's fine, whatever you want and whatever you want to do. And clearly also, we're not a huge room of people, feel free to speak if you want to speak out. Or equally, if you want to keep quiet, feel free to do that as well. It's, it's whatever you want to do. It's just whatever you like. And we've got quite a bit of time to talk about Azure Mobile Services. And I don't know that I'll take the whole 90 minutes, we'll see how we get along. It might be around about the 75 minute mark, something like that. And we'll see, we'll see how it works out. So a too tightly sort of controlled plan. Um, to put this into context, I'm going to do a sort of overview of what Azure Mobile Services is, and we'll do that mainly by um, playing around a little bit in Visual Studio with some code and an Azure Mobile Services in, in the browser, playing with things there. I do have some pictures just to kind of set the scene and do a few things, but the majority of this is going to be in, in developer tools and stuff rather than rather than in PowerPoint. Probably 90 minutes of PowerPoint is, is, is an awful lot of PowerPoint. Um, for me, it would be good to know, are people already using Azure Mobile Service? Are you already a mobile service person or expert? Or anything like that? Playing with, okay. So for the rest of you, you are the perfect audience for this. Um, not to single you out in any moments, but believe. Um, <laughs> you are the perfect audience for this. It's not my intention that you come here knowing all this stuff already. If you did, you probably know more about it than I'm going to talk about in this session. Some things you might pick up as you go along, some things you might say, no, actually, I'm not sure about that, but feel free to chip in. And the other thing that would be useful for me to know is, is what sort of uh, skill sets you have. Do people do things with .NET? Is that something that's part of your skill set? Fine. Okay. That's a that's All right, so let's kick off. Um, Probably the, the best question is, you know, hey, what's this all about? I was saying that's a good place to start. So, so what is this stuff about? And, and by way of setting the scene a little bit, um, kind of kind of simple stuff in some ways. Is that going to work for me? Good. Um, there's an awful lot of people out there. I'm sure this hasn't escaped your notice. There's a lot of people out there building apps of some sort, um, client-side apps of some sort. Um, you've probably seen that, that Microsoft in recent months has re- What's the right word? Rebranded itself as a devices and services company, um, with this focus on, on client-side apps to some extent. Uh, so there's a lot of people out there building apps of all different shapes and sizes across mobile devices, um, phones, tablets, and, and to some extent at Microsoft, we also think of laptops as, as mobile devices. We include those in one of our mobile platforms. So we think of that's kind of a mobile device. I, I brought it with me today. Um, and so we can then think of that as well. And <coughs> are people building apps in the room? Is stuff, stuff that you do? You build one and then talk to Okay. And um, we can also actually expand this out a little bit and think of, uh, in some ways, we can think of the stuff you're building on the website as, as an app as well, in some ways. So we can probably try and include more people that way. There's a bunch of these things that are standalone on device applications. Typically, people are getting hold of apps, updating apps, finding apps by interaction with the cloud. So most of these apps are coming from some kind of app store. It might be one of ours, it might be Google Play, it might be Amazon's, it might be iTunes. Um, but most of these things are coming from the cloud in the first instance to get down onto the device. Some of those apps, when they arrive on the device, have no more interaction with the cloud. 
you know, he might be, he might have built, or some of the guy today who built a quiz app. The quiz is downloaded to the device, runs on the device, that's it, end of story. It doesn't do anything beyond that. Most apps, or at least a good percentage of apps, do require <coughs> something more than just what's happening on the device. And um, some of that might be sort of implicit use of the cloud. So if you look, for instance, at, at Windows devices, if you're a developer and you build for a Windows device, you can build an app and you can write a file into a special folder. And we will roam that for your app, for that user, to all of their devices for free. You just write a file in the folder and it shows up on the other, user, the other devices that the user has. That's kind of implicit use of the cloud. The developer doesn't really care that it's the cloud that's doing that. They just want it to happen and it just magically happens. But mostly, um, cloud use is probably going to be, to be more explicit. It's going to be something that the developer actually codes into their application. It might be something simple like you know, saving files to something like OneDrive or Dropbox or something like that. Or it might be a fully fledged, fully featured cloud service. You know, going back to the example of somebody builds a game. Uh, anyone played the game Word or something like that? It's quite a, a popular game on the Windows phone. Um, it's a simple sort of quiz game where it's building up a leaderboard against other players around the rest of the world. You need to stick that in the cloud somewhere in order to do it. So, you know, the thing is that some apps are going to be standalone, but a lot of apps are going to require some kind of cloud presence. That's kind of how that stuff works out. Um, we have a cloud. This is not going to shock you too much. Don't, don't focus too much on the branding. I, I think we've renamed it Microsoft Azure in the last day or two. I haven't got a pretty fit map for that. So this, this is pronounced Microsoft Azure. That's how that works. Um, we have, we have Microsoft Azure, and it has a ton of capabilities. It's a big cloud platform. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. They package it up into a bunch of slices. Um, this sort of slice is something that we call infrastructure as a service, which is essentially, hey, you can go spin up some virtual machine in the cloud. You can pick the operating system to run on it. You can install software to run on it. And you can RDP your way into that thing and go play with that box in the cloud. You, know, you can kind of go up there and say, hey, I want a Linux box. You get into a Linux box, and then you go do whatever you want with it. It's just a box in the cloud. It's a piece of infrastructure provided as a service, so you don't have to buy the box. You don't have to install the box. You don't have to worry about patching the OS on the box and that kind of stuff. So you can do that. That's one of the things you can do with Azure. And one of their other slices of functionality is what they call platform as a service. So you can actually buy into the architecture of Windows Azure. You can build an application out of a thing called a web role, which is the front end for your, your application. It might be a, a website or a web service, more likely. And you can have a worker role, which goes and picks stuff off <coughs> yours own storage, things like tables and queues, pulls out work items, does stuff with them, shoves them into some kind of data store. It might be one of ours, it might be some other kind of data store. And you can go that way. And that typically is buying into uh, that, that, that cloud vendor in quite a strong way because you're actually changing the architecture of what you do to suit that particular cloud platform. So we have that too. And then the last sort of really packaged um, functionality that I'll talk about here at least is we also have Azure Websites. And Azure Websites is kind of interesting because in some ways Azure Websites has been built out of these two things sort of coming together. It's more of a sort of package thing. It's more of a way of saying, yeah, we've got this cloud stuff. But if you want to just build a website in PHP, we can make that easier for you than having to learn all this stuff about setting up load balancers and monkeying around with domain names and whatever it might be. We can make that easier for you. We have a sort of packaged offering called websites, and that's where you would head by default if you wanted to build a website. Fair enough. And of course, you can build ASP.NET up there as well, and various other technologies. We're, we're pretty agnostic on that kind of stuff. So Azure can do all this stuff, but um, I think it's fair to say, and we can, we can argue about this if you want, but well, not too long, hopefully. Um, I think it's fair to say that if you want to build a mobile app, and, and I've built a few mobile apps and published them, the barrier to entry on that stuff is relatively low. So if you want to build for iOS or Android or Windows or Windows Phone, one of those things, your, um, your barrier to entry down here is relatively low. You, you typically probably go get a device, maybe, or use of an emulator, and you go and get a free SDK, and you typically get a free developer tool, and you might have to register in a store. I think our registration is down to about 11 quid a year or something like that now. 
you kind of good to go, you know, and there's, there's loads of tutorials online and off you go and you, you get on with it. And it can be quite, um, for a dev team, it can be quite a, a sort of independent, isolated thing. You've got your devices, you build your code, you test it on the device, you're good to go. Um, it's my contention in this session, and this is a bit we can discuss if you like, that it's a bit harder than that to approach a, a cloud vendor and spin up a back end for that application. So to go to Windows Azure and think, right, I want a back end for my, my mobile app, I need this kind of web service, I need this kind of storage, I need this kind of load balancing, I think it's quite a bit harder. I think it's a harder thing to do. So if you want to build a back end, I think the barrier to entry on that is higher, it's much harder. And what we're trying to do with mobile services is we're trying to bring that down a little bit. We're trying to bring that so that that barrier to entry is easier than having to fully understand all of these different pieces that we've got at Windows Azure or that some other cloud vendor has put <coughs> on their cloud system, whether it be Google or Amazon or whoever it might be. And it's, it's worth saying that, um, well actually let me just show you the next picture because it kind of leads to that. So mobile services, the idea of this is we're taking some of the pieces we've already built, so we're taking some of our platform as a service bit, we're taking some of our infrastructure as a service bit, and you like this, I spent time on this animation, you might watch this, it's good. And we're kind of banging them together. It's not quite as good as I've sold it as. There you go. I was proud of that. Um, this is Microsoft Azure, of course. And um, we're banging these things together to come up with mobile services, uh, which is something we call back end as a service. And um, that's not our term, we didn't invent that. And we're not the only people doing this. There are other vendors out there doing mobile back end as a service. You might have heard of vendors like StackMob or PARS. Or I was listening to one of the guys from Telerik the other day, the controls company, they have a back end as a service as well. There's a bunch of people doing this. But the idea is rather than present somebody with just a bare cloud platform, you present them with something that's already kind of got the features they want and makes it a lot easier to switch those features on and off. Oh, God, do you know this thing? Um, what sort of features are we talking about with this stuff? The sort of things that we got, we hope are the sort of things that a mobile app developer wants. Probably the primary one of these things is, is data. The ability to store some data up there in the cloud and, and obviously get back to it, um, that kind of thing. As soon as you stick data in the cloud, generally speaking, your next question is going to be, well, how do I access it and who can access it? That's, that's going to be your next worry as soon as you stick something on the internet. So, so we have authentication and authorization there as well. And um, once you've got your data in the cloud and you've got it sort of secured, the next thing is going to be something along the lines of, well, I want to do stuff with the data. That might be as the data is manipulated. It might be as you get the data or change the data. But it also might just be, hey, you know, once a day I'm building a lottery app and I just need to pick out who's the winner that day. And so we have the ability to run server-side logic in the cloud. Um, and if you were notifying that lottery winner, typically for a mobile app, you're going to want to notify them via something like a push notification because you can't, you know, if you're running on my phone, if you're an app on my phone right now, you're not running because I'm not, I'm not using your app on that phone. If you want to notify me, you'll have to use a push notification down to that, down to that device. And, and so as you see, as we go along, we support pretty simple setup for push notifications, and we support that. For Android, we support it for iOS, we support it for Windows, we support it for Windows Phone, and we, we kind of abstract the differences to some extent with that. We also support um, a bit of logging, so you can get some diagnostics out of what you're doing in the cloud. Um, we support scheduling, that is, I want to run a piece of logic every so often, and we'll do that as we go along in the session. And because this stuff is built on Azure, we can fairly, um, I don't want to say elastically, because that's somebody else's, isn't it? We can fairly, um, rubbery, rubbery, bouncy, scale things up and down. Elastically scale things up and down. And so, pretty much our, our last bit of intro here. Mobile services, it, it's a packaged way to create a backend for a mobile app. The services that you would build with this thing are RESTful services. They speak HTTP, stroke S, and JSON data by default. So you can pretty much use them from anywhere you want. To make life a little bit easier, we have built specific client-side SDKs for Windows Phone, for Windows 8, for iOS, for Android, for websites, for JavaScript API, and just recently for PhoneGap as well. 
So we've got client side support for all those different kinds of things. Up in the cloud, you don't necessarily have to really care, but you might end up caring. You are actually running on node.js, and your data is persisted inside a SQL Server database. By default, that's what you get. Uh, and you can play with this from Visual Studio, or you can play from it. It's important to say, you can set this stuff up from Visual Studio, which is probably what I'll do here, but um, as we go along, bear in mind that everything I do from Visual Studio can also be done from just the web portal. So if you were on iOS, for instance, you don't... I, I've shown this to people before and had people come up and say, well, I'm on iOS and I can use Visual Studio. And it's like, yeah, but you can do this from, from outside Visual Studio as well. Don't worry, you, you can do this from anywhere. And in terms of where this is right now, um, this is live at Azure. You will spot that there are some features up there that are still in preview. So they're clearly marked in the portal with a big green word saying preview on them. One of the features that's currently in preview is the ability to build your backend in .NET rather than build it in JavaScript. I'm not going to show building a backend in .NET today. Um, that's still in preview. Um, it's something you can do with web API in .NET and something you can set up. I also can't say that some of the things that are in preview right now will still be in preview by the end of the day because we've got our build conference tonight in uh, San Francisco. For all I know, this, this, this could change in the course of the day. So this might be the last time that some of these things are true. Who knows? Um, if you are new to Azure, are people Azure users? Oh, yeah, mostly. So if you're in that bucket at the bottom, trying mobile services using mobile services shouldn't cost you anything more than you're currently paying for your Azure. You shouldn't have to switch on any money to do this. If you're not on Azure, you can always go and try a trial. And again, it shouldn't cost you any money to set up mobile services and try it out on Azure. You shouldn't have to pay anything to try that out. It's 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 by your MSDN. Yes, it must Free be. Trial. It must be because I think that's how, well, it's how, not how I'm using it today, but yes, I think it is. You can get a free trial. All right, so um, let's switch away from this and play around with it. <coughs> Let me pop this in. <coughs> So um, what we're going to do is play with a very simple scenario. I always use simple <coughs> scenarios um, because I think it, it kind of helps to, to demonstrate concepts rather than get bogged down in something big and hairy and, and ugly. And so what we'll do is I'll open a project here in Visual Studio. Let me just show you what this is. And perhaps the best way of saying what this is in the first instance is to run it. Um, so this is a, a Windows 8.1 app. It could equally be a phone app. It could equally be an Android app, but I guess more complicated up here for me because um, I have to write Java and I'm not great at that anymore. Uh, so let's let's just run this up in the first instance. If it's happy to be run, apologies for all the things that look like UI in any way. Uh, and the idea here of this in quotes scenario is imagine imagine for a minute that you are me. I know it's a horrible place to be, um, and you're giving conference talks like this. You might want a place to um, register your conference talks somewhere online and have attendees to your sessions be able to vote on those sessions and say, that was a good session, that was a bad session, that was the worst 90 minutes of my life ever, I'm coming for you. And that kind of thing. So imagine you want to do that. Really, what does this give us? It, it's a place to talk about a table in the cloud. That's really what it's about. So I've got this Windows 8.1 app here. It's not, it's not great, it's not very functional. What you'll notice in the first instance is that um, nothing in the app, if, if I've got the right version of it, nothing in the app should work. Okay, so it doesn't automatically go off and get data. You have to click a, a little refresh button down there. Uh, and what you spot is the, um, just an error from an exception saying we haven't written that bit of the application yet. And if we try and add a talk into this, um, into this application. So here's how we could add a talk and we try and do that. Well, we haven't written that bit of the application yet either. And because you can't add any talks, you can't remove any talks. Um, there's a sort of tautology in there, so when you can't, you can't remove what you haven't added. And nor can you register for push notifications, and nor can you log in. Okay? So in some ways, it's a, it's a, a taste of things to come. We will be implementing this functionality as we go along. If we just have a look at the code for a second, if I just stop this debugging. This is all um, .NET code, it's all written in C Sharp, and I only really want to show you two pieces of this. I've got, if you like, a sort of model class, um, the way that I want to represent a conference talk, a data class, if you like. So we just bring that up, and let me pop that down over there. So if you take a look at this, I say, hey, a conference talk 
has a, an ID, has a presenter, there's a title, there's a date. The number of times it's been rated, so if you all vote, we'd have about 25 ratings, something like that. The total rating score, so you know, if you all voted 5 out of 5, 25 times 5 ratings in there. If you've um, been around .NET a while, and I think most of you have, you'd recognize that this has been attributed with data contract serialization attributes, which means that we're making certain properties of this object available for serialization by a data contract serializer. In this particular case, while we'll never actually see it in print, we're going to use the JSON data contract serializer to serialize these objects into date JSON. And I don't serialize this field here, the average score, because I can compute that from Make sense? So that's my data object, and then we have abstracted wherever this application would like to talk to the cloud in order to store stuff. So I've got this little class called Cloud Service Access, <coughs> and it has, um, it has a method on it to go and get the talks, the list of talks, and because we're going across the network on Windows 8.1, that means we will be asynchronous, and so we return effectively a list of those conference talks asynchronously. When it comes time to insert a talk, we take a talk, and we, we get across the network and insert it asynchronously. Of course, at the moment, none of this stuff is implemented. Delete, we take a talk and we delete it asynchronously. Log in, we would log in, and register, we register. And none of this stuff is implemented at the moment. Does that kind of make sense? Just as an aside, actually, I, I missed something. If we just go back to this conference talk definition, can we do, um, can we do that? Excellent. Um, you'll notice this ID on here. This is actually a requirement of mobile services. Mobile services requires that you have a column called ID, which is a GUID type. It's the way that it wants to identify things. It's just a convention that it kind of forces on you. So this wasn't just my choice. What did you do to open that up in life? I would, yeah, I, uh, at Alt and F12. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's something, I don't remember what it's called, but it's new in BS 2013. It's nice. Um, so he was valuing yes. community. <laughs> so there we go, we got that stuff there. And none of this stuff works. So what we need to do is we need to set up a cloud backend and start to get some of this stuff actually up there in the cloud doing something for us. The way I'm going to do that here is I have already connected my Visual Studio to Windows Azure, so I've used one of these two options. I can't quite remember which one it was. It's either that one or that one. But it involves you connecting Visual Studio to Azure and it's written down online and you get your Azure subscription married up with your Visual Studio. And that lets you wander into Windows Azure and see what you've got up there. And I'm trying to keep this as blank as possible for demonstration purposes, but hopefully up at mobile services, I should have nothing, which is exactly what I want. Okay, so we've got that thing up at, um, up at mobile services. So how did you get this, this functionality Windows Azure? Uh, what do you need to do in Visual Studio? Uh, Visual Studio just, just kind of has this stuff. Uh, I don't think you have to ensure the. I don't think you have to install the Azure SDK. I think I just connected my Visual Studio to my Azure subscription with um, with one of these options here. But I, I can find you a link as to how to set this up. Um, it's a one-off step. You don't have to do it more than once, which is probably why I'm a little bit fussy as to how I did it. But I did it. It can't be, it can't be too hard, because I did it. I think the first time you opened in 2013, it says, do you want to connect to it? Yeah. Uh, possibly. Yeah. But yeah. Certainly, it will certainly connect you to Visual Studio Online by your um, Live ID or Microsoft account, and I can't remember what the steps are to get right to here, but it's very doable, let's put it that way. It's not, it's not hard to do that. That's not the hardest thing we'll do in this, in this particular talk, hopefully. So we've got that set up. So what I can do is go to Mobile Services over here, and we can create a service. So let's go create a service. And this pops a dialogue with my, um, visual, my Azure subscription on there. And I'm going to create a service. We'll call this MT is for me, we'll call it talks service. And that's going to give me a service, MT talks service dot azure mobile.net. That's where that service is going to be on the web. And the dialogue says, where do you want to put it? And I say, well, I'll put it in North Europe. Where do you want your database? Do you want to pay for a database or do you want a free database? Well, I'll go for a free database. And give me a, a, a username for that database, give me a password, and create that thing. 
So what's the difference between obviously the free and paid version? <laughs> well, the free, we give you, um, with the trial for instance, and the free version of mobile services, I'll talk a little bit at the end about pricing, but it's not my speciality, but um, with the free version of mobile services, we give you a free database, but it's limited to be only 20 megs in size. So if you, you can have a little database, but if you want to grow up, then you have to pay for that. That's, that's really the difference. So we could easily fill this database, but we won't do in this particular session. This takes a little time, um, but what you've got to bear in mind is it's, it's always going to be quicker than doing this yourself with all of the other bits that a cloud, a cloud platform provides. It takes a minute or so, let's just let that spin up and There we go. All right, so Visual Studio has spoken <coughs> to the cloud. It's created and provisioned for me a new SQL Server database, a new server, if you like, in front of that running Node, and that's kind of become now my, my server for my service. Um, there shouldn't be anything sort of hanging off here at the moment, I don't think. One thing we can do here is we could view the logs for this service, but there aren't any, I don't think, just yet. And the other thing we could do is we could browse to this portal over here. So, Let's just do that. I'm going to bring up the web browser and show you kind of how that, that looks. Let's just see if that goes over there. I'm just going to sign into Azure and let's let that happen. And so if I hadn't been using Visual Studio, this is just the Azure management portal, and some of the fonts might be a bit smaller on here, but hopefully you can, you can see what we're doing. Just shout if it's, if it's not visible enough. Um, so what that's done is under my mobile services tab, as it's given me a mobile service, what I could have done was just done new mobile service create, and that's kind of the same dialogue that's <coughs> popped up in Visual Studio, but we make it so you don't have to leave Visual Studio if you don't want to. <coughs> On this sort of um, home page here, what you'll find is a download for a number of different code projects. One for Windows Store, one for Windows Phone, one for iOS, Android, HTML, Xamarin, I forgot to mention Xamarin, if you're doing crossplatform.net, we also give you a Xamarin project and PhoneGap. The idea of those are that you can click on that, it'll download a project for you, like an Xcode project or a Visual Studio project, that already has the right libraries installed and already has a bit of code in it to actually connect to your service in the cloud. So it's kind of like a Kickstarter sort of thing in a way. And we're not going to do that here, but it, it can be a handy way of just kind of getting going if you, if you want to do that kind of thing. Just having a quick look around this dashboard for a second. Um, a simple dashboard of you know how much have we been using our service and well we haven't used our service at all yet so not much to go on that graph at the moment. You can do some additional things. You can set up monitoring on the endpoint to see if your endpoint is alive. You can play around with scaling. You can see your <coughs> URL and where your service is hosted and where your database is. And if you want to, you can get SQL Management Studio and point it at the database and go and have a look and play around with the tables. Not really going to do that right now. You can also link this with source control, so you can push from um, TFS or Git into here. Actually, it might only you can push from Git certainly into here. I'm not sure about TFS. I'm sure they've got that. Caveat that for you. But you can push from source control into here if you want to. Um, here, right now, let's have a look at this tab over here as well, where I can configure my database and my server. We can switch on or off this notion of dynamic schema. I'll try and talk about what that is as we go along. If we're doing stuff on the web, we can set up cross-origin security stuff. Um, we can have some simple name value settings for the app. And then on the scale tab, what I'm using at the moment, and what I'll use for the whole session, is I'm running mobile services as free. That gives us, in this case, well, I'm also using a free database, but that, I'm using this in the free, in the free packaging. What that gives me is one virtual server that is shared with somebody else. I have a shared virtual server, it's not dedicated to my hosting. Um, if you want to, you can start to pay us money, and we're always happy for you to pay us money here at Microsoft, that's great. Um, you can switch to basic pricing, and you can switch to standard pricing. 
And what that allows you to do is start to have reserved servers where it is your server and you're not sharing it with somebody else. And you can also scale up the number of instances. So you can start to say, no, I want six instances of my service. And you can start to scale it up automatically as well, depending on how many API calls you get. So you can play around with those settings, but we'll come over here to stay free. OK, cool. That'll probably be doing that. So what I want to do is I want to store stuff in the cloud. So the next thing I would do is I would go and create a table on this, uh, on this service. So let's just go and create a table from Visual Studio. Let's do that. I'm going to call this conference talk because that matches my code, conference talk. And I get to specify permissions on the table. For the minute, I'm just going to say that everybody can do everything with my particular table. So everyone can do everything. And we create that table. It doesn't take as long as creating the service to do it. One of the things I want to kind of point out is that what we've, what we've just done with those two mouse clicks pretty much, and a bunch of subscriptions and so on set up, is that we've created a RESTful service on the public internet. And that thing is live now and, you know, malicious, vicious people around the world will be inserting data into that service right now. And, and it's very, very low barrier to entry. I want to kind of illustrate this a little bit. If we just run up PowerShell for a second, uh, I'm not a huge PowerShell user. I'm a huge PowerShell fan, just not a huge PowerShell user. And let me just load a script for you. So one of the things PowerShell does for, for you is gives you nice little uh, shortcuts to be able to invoke RESTful, RESTful services. So, um, here would be the URL for my service. You'll notice that we've got the service, talk service at mobile.net slash tables, slash conference talk. That's the table we just created. And so we could do um, an HTTP get against that service. So ideally, we should be able to go and do an HTTP get up there. And I wouldn't expect, unless one of you people had just put records into that table, which you could be doing, um, I wouldn't expect that there would be anything in that table right now, and it looks like there, aren't, there isn't anything in that table. But even from something like a, a simple command prompt, we could go and create records in that table. So um, this is PowerShell trying to do that. Um, if you're a PowerShell guru, excuse my naivety at how I perhaps do this. Um, I get the date, I turn it into a string, I create a record, a .NET object with an anonymous types, with a presenter, a title, a session date, a rating count, and a rating score. I convert that to JSON, and then I do an invoke with a post, and I send that JSON up to that service. Um, and off we go. And just by doing that post of that JSON data, we posted that to that service. It's living in that service. It's real data within that service. If we go back over to um, our management portal, and we navigate across to data over here, uh, yeah, that's okay. Here's our conference talk table. Let's have a look at it. And there's our little record living up there in that table. Um, how did this happen? Well, because we left on the dynamic schema option. So when the JSON arrives at the service, we just look at the record, we look at the table, we say, well, the table's not got any columns, and there's a bunch of stuff in this record, so let's just adjust the schema. And we automatically infer schema, and we generate the schema. You might notice um, the ID column, and you might notice three columns at the end, created out, updated out, and version. Those things we didn't create, and those things are there for concurrency, optimistic concurrency checking. So those things are, are just added by mobile services. So as you might expect, having put that record in the table, we could probably get it back out. Let's just um, see if we can do that get on that service again. Hopefully we can get that thing back out. And there's the record as it was before. We actually support, I don't know, has anyone ever looked at OData as a, as, a, as a format, as a specification? There's a standard that we worked on, I don't know, quite a few years ago now. In OData, there's a, a standard way of building up a, a URI such that you can query relational data with it. You can specify a WHERE clause, a, a SELECT clause, an ORDER BY clause, all in a, a query string. And mobile services supports a little subset of that, um, WHERE clauses and ORDER BY's and SELECTs. So it doesn't support all of it, but it supports some of it. <laughs> and just to give you a simple example of that, um, I take the URI URL and just add on, hey, I only want to select the ID and the title. 
And if we invoke that bit of restful stuff, there's the idea and the title of that record. So I'm just projecting those fields back from that service. And then just to finish this story, if I wanted to delete a record, what I could perhaps do is just copy this GUID here. Let's just see if I can grab that. Replace that GUID there, because that's not the right GUID. And then we could do a HTTP delete by appending a slash GUID on the end of conference talk slash GUID and delete it. So ideally, if we go and invoke that, we've deleted that record. And if we go back up here and invoke again, we shouldn't have anything in that table anymore. Right? So I would argue a very, very, you know, if you take out all my blathering on, creating the RESTful service and creating the endpoint takes around about a minute or two, um, which is a very, very quick and, and easy way to get that stuff created. <coughs> I'm just going to cheat for a minute, so close your eyes. Um, I'm going to just delete this table and recreate it, because the way I've created it from this PowerShell prompt is going to really make a mess of what I'm about to do in my code. So, you, you didn't see me do this. I, I never will acknowledge that I deleted this table and recreated it. Um, it's more my lack of PowerShell than anything. But, uh, so let's just get rid of it. I think it's probably gone. And let's create another table. So are these Azure tables no. or are they in SQL? They're yeah, SQL tables. That's a great question. So can you have them created through the NST framework code first and that sort of thing? You may be able to do some of that if you go down the web API route of putting a .NET backend behind this. Uh, you, you, could, you could create the tables any way you want. The only thing I say is that mobile services has a fairly sort of naive view of SQL schema. It, doesn't necess it isn't necessarily going to understand all your schema and especially all of your relationships. So it does take a somewhat simple view of, of how tables are structured, which can mean that if you've got a big complex schema, um, you might end up having to do quite a bit of work inside of your server-side scripts to bring that together. And um, you'll probably see some of that as we go along here. Uh, let's just recreate this. So I was actually using the portal to do what we previously did in Visual Studio. Okay, great. We well, also need to cover the security stuff. Yeah, let's look at that. We'll get there. Yeah, we should get that. We will get that. Um, so we've got that table set up again, and. Um, what would be nice, of course, is our application actually started to talk to that table now in the cloud. And there's a way in which we can do that. There's a number of ways of doing what I'm about to do. This is the simplest way of doing it. And we've built a little bit of tooling into Visual Studio. So if you want to talk to one of these services, you can right mouse on a project like this. Um, I'll say it's a little bit strange to me. I feel this should be hanging off the Add Service Reference button here in Visual Studio. But I've got a feeling that that dialog must be hard to customize because it hangs off this add connected service button over here. It's a bit weird, but that's where it's hanging on. So I can add a connected service into this project. This doesn't really do very much, but I'll show you it anyway. And it goes and has a look for your mobile services and finds the one we just created, and then you can say OK. Fine. This doesn't do an awful lot. And what it does is it adds some references into your project that you could have got from the NuGet anyway. Um, it adds a client-side SDK for Azure Mobile and extensions. It adds a reference to JSON.NET for JSON serialization. If you've not worked on Windows 8 apps, right, there's no JSON serializer stuff in there, so they, they do this. Some bits for HTTP and some bits for tasks and so on, but basically it adds those two as a primary two that it adds. The other thing it does, like it or not, is it, it hacks your application class for you. Um, you probably won't like this, but I'm going to leave it in place just for our demo. I, I wouldn't leave this quite as they did it, but, but let's have a look. Onto your app class over here, it puts a public static field, not madly keen on that myself, but never mind, of type mobile service client, which is really the proxy class that they use to talk to their service in the cloud. You don't have to use it, you can just use raw HTTP requests, they're just making it a bit easier. Um, let me just shorten this down a little bit. Let's get rid of all that. And let's just resolve that namespace. And um, let me get, sorry, just, okay. let's get rid of that. And what they do as well is they, they encode in your URL for your service. And they also build in this thing <coughs> called the application key for your service, um, which they sniffed out of the cloud. We're not actually going to use the application key in this particular session, so we're just going to get rid of that. Um, I'm also just going to rename this thing um, 
proxy, something like that, just to make it more clear what it is. Yeah? Uh, if we go and have a look at our code now then, we've got this proxy class. Um, let's go to our cloud service access class. This is the one that we want to speak to the cloud. And I'm going to replace this with a different implementation. So I'm just going to get rid of the whole thing. All gone. And I should have, hopefully, <laughs> a snippet that replaces it. Let's talk about what this does. And the first thing I'm going to have to do is just rename this some proxies. So what I've done here is I've implemented a simple property called talks table. That's the table that we're playing with. And that returns a mobile service table of type conference call, which you've already seen. And it just calls into the proxy saying, hey, give me the conference talk table. Now this is purely about shaping stuff on the client side. That call there does not cross the network. It doesn't do anything like that. It's just sort of setting up a shape of objects that we want to work with. There's actually two ways of programming this proxy. You can do stuff like um, app.proxy.get me a table called conference talk. And then you can say, OK, insert a record. And we'll say, OK, give us a JSON object then. So you have a loosely typed programming interface if you want to just create JSON objects yourself. That's fine. Or you can say, which this is kind of how I use this, give me the table shaped around conference talk, insert a record, OK, I need a conference talk instance. So you can either work at JSON or you can work at objects. If you work at objects, we'll just serialize them into JSON for you. It's your choice, whatever you want to do. Um, so I've just created that, um, that little property there. So now when it comes time to get the talks, what we do is we get that table, we ask it to make a query. I'm only doing that to show you that you can ask it to do queries with where clauses and order bys and so on. I order the sessions by session date, and then I say, OK, cross the network, do the HTTP, do the JSON, and get me the data back, and ultimately it goes on the screen. When it comes time to do an insert, we say, hey, go to the table, do an insert, same for delete, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Make sense? Cool. So ideally, if we run this up at this point, it should start to do something. Let's just see how that works. So we can go, we should be able to add a record. Let's say um, talk one, talk one. And let's go back a few days. Um, let's go into another month. Oh, my Lord. Let's go back a few days. 30th of March, great, talk one. And that should be hitting the proxy across to the cloud, into the table, just working out <coughs> the schema and, and coming back. Okay, talk one's in there. Let's go put in talk two. Uh -huh. Let's go put in talk three. Must have happened in April. Da -da -da. Doesn't really matter, actually. Um, talk three. Great. All right, so they're in there, and if we go back to our table, as you would expect, that stuff should be sitting in that conference table, talk table in the cloud, as you've seen before. Cool. Cool. There he is. So you are trying to insert that record. Is that an object term, so a JSON object? Yeah, so when we call through the proxy, yeah. it will use the data contract JSON serialized to serialize that into JSON and HTTP. Could you show that again, please? Yeah. Sorry. Which bit? The, this so one? That this one. Yeah, so what does that call? What? So it calls, it, it gets that. Um, oh, that's your conference talk. That's what the JSON object is. It? That's yeah. right, that's my, yeah. that's that class that I've got the serialization attributes on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happens if you add another property to that conference talk? Does that get created automatically in SQL? Or, or yes. It does. Yes, as long as you've left on dynamic schema. Yes. As you ship your software, you may want to turn off dynamics. So, so does that do migrations <laughs> as well, then? Does it do, sorry? Migrations on, on, on data or anything like that? I, all it's doing is adding a nullable column. Right. It's just it's not nothing super clever. It's just adding a nullable column to the table, and all the existing records will have null in that column, and the new record won't. So just a side note, I assume you can go to SQL Server and add your indexes and all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, you can point management studio at this database if you want to. Uh, where have we got to? We've inserted those. We've seen that they're there. Cool. Okay, let's delete one just to make sure we can remove the record. Okay, one of those things is gone. You probably trust me that the data's gone into the table as well over there. So we got that thing set up and that's all working quite nicely. Um, 
there's a couple of problems with what we've got here. Um, one problem would be that um, I've now set this up so that if this was my, my, my way of monitoring my talks, the problem, one problem I've got is that anyone anywhere can insert this stuff, delete it, and play around with it. That's a bit of a problem for me. And the other problem is that if I was using this and you were using this app for your talks, um, at the moment, the way we've got it is we've just got a talks table and we don't know who the talks belong to, which is a bit of a problem as well because we're all getting all records all of the time. So ideally, we would be able to identify where this stuff was coming from. And, and to do that, we need some kind of authentication in order to set this up. So let's do that. Let's go back over to Visual Studio. We could do this in the portal, it doesn't matter. And let's go back to that conference talk table and edit those permissions. And we'll get a little bit more serious and say, no, sorry, you need to be an authenticated user to do this stuff. You need to be authenticated. And so we change the permissions on that table. There we go. Let's go back to the app. Let's get data. And ideally, that's going to fail. Ideally. Just thinking about it. And it's failed. Okay, so we're no longer authorized to, uh, to do that kind of thing. In order to authenticate with one of these services, what they use is they use OAuth 2 on the server side. So if you've got your own custom OAuth um, provider, we can, we can work with that and there's blog posts about how you can implement that. What we do out of, out of the box, if you like, is we have um, already built support for authentication, as you might expect, with a Microsoft account, a Live ID, whatever you want to call those things but also with a Google account, a Twitter account, or a Facebook account. So if you've got users who would fall into one of those categories, you can pretty easily switch on authentication for those users. So let's have a look at that. Let's go back to the latest Visual Studio. And what I'm going to use here today, I usually use Twitter, but I've switched recently. I'm going to use Google. We're going to authenticate with Google. And what that involves is going up to Google's Cloud Console and setting up an app in Google's Cloud Console. So let's do that. Let's go. And I find the hardest thing with Google's Cloud Console is remembering what the URL is for it. So I've got a shortcut to it on my end. You'll notice a whole bunch of rubbish in here that's pending deletion. Don't worry about any of that. Let's create a new project in Google's Cloud. And we'll call this, what's the last one I used? MT Source Service 5, which is going to be Angelic Triumph 538. So Google Cloud thing, he goes off and does whatever it does. Um, you can have a look at it doing it, it's doing it. <coughs> okay, so that's great. Um, let's not talk about what this might be. Looks a bit similar to what we're talking about. Never mind. Let's go over to APIs. <laughs> Let's go over to APIs and auth up here, because um, that's what we want to do. And let's go to create credentials over here, and create a new auth client ID. Click on that. It's, we can say it's for a web application, that's fine. And this is going to be coming from mttalksservice.azure-mobile.net slash, no, I think that's probably enough. <coughs> and if I remember rightly, the callback needs to go to login slash Google. Let me just make sure I've got that. Right, someone. Yeah, login slash Google, that's right. So if I attend TTOC service to do mobile.net, okay, that should be okay. So we'll create this, and that gives us, um, as all these OAuth things do, a set of magic security <coughs> gubbins that we can then copy. We need this client ID from Google, mm -hmm. and then we pop over to our Azure mobile service, which is over here, and we can go to the identity tab over here. There's the slot for Microsoft, there's the one for Facebook, there's the one for Twitter. We put Google at the bottom. Um, no comments on that, don't they? Oh no, we put the Windows Azure Active Directory at the bottom. That's a, a relatively new one. So you could also federate your Active Directory and log in that way. Um, don't ask me to show you that. I have no idea how to set that up right now. There's the client ID from Google. There's the client secret from Google. And we can save that for our mobile service. Yes. So if we pop back over to the client side, the last thing to do is implement login functionality on the client side, because we've got a button at the moment that just throws an exception. So if we go back over to the client side, is this? Yeah, this is our app, just stop. Okay. Let's go to um, 
our cloud service access. Let's go to the login method. And on the proxy, there is a handy login async. There's even a special one for Microsoft, but login async. What kind of provider are you using? We're using Google. Um, it's an async method, so I should probably really uh, await that thing. Um, it probably doesn't really matter in this circumstance. And now we should be able to log in. So let, let's see what happens with that. Let's press it and see where we go with that. Now there. <coughs> let's try and log in. What this is using is a standard piece of Windows 8.1 functionality called the Web Authentication Broker. It's consistent UI for logging in with OAuth so that the user doesn't get a random series of dialogues that all look different. Um, so I can log in with my Google account. I'm not sure that right. And sign in. Uh, Windows 8.1 specifically tries to be helpful here in a minute, I hope. Let's see. Yeah, that's Google's message, that's fine. And then this is our message. I'm not going to ask Windows 8.1 to remember my credentials for Google. It can do securely. Um, but I'm not going to ask it to do that because I just want you to see every time I'm logging in because it gets a bit uh, transparent otherwise, I suppose. So we should now be logged in uh, in accordance with OAuth at Google. And so we should be able to refresh and get our data back from our service. So we managed to get ourselves authenticated against that thing. We still got a problem here though because this is still returning um, every record out of the table, it doesn't know that they are my records. So what we typically want to do is now start to associate these records with me. That's the next thing we really want to do. Um, so what, what we can do is, if we go out to Visual Studio and have a look at our table, um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but you'll know that um, the way this stuff works with one of these tables is that as your data is going in and out of these tables, there's a little pipeline um, leading up to and coming away from the table, if you like. And there are four little scripts that run as you read data, as you insert data, as you update data, and as you delete data. And you can change those scripts, so you can have logic running as stuff is going in and out of the tables, which is quite nice. Um, this is where you encounter um, JavaScript and Node. That's what we're sitting on top of. As we were talking about earlier on, there is in preview a version of doing this with Web API and .NET. Um, but the built-in stuff is with JavaScript and Node. And, uh, well, you know, let's have a look at it. So, if, for instance, when we're doing an insert, here's what's actually happening up on the server. It's not, it's not going to look too scary. Um, when we're doing an insert, the item arrives with the user and the request. And by default, we just do the default behavior, which is execute the request, which means you know, turn it into a SQL record, insert it into your SQL server, get the, get the status code back and shove that back down the wire as an HTTP status. That's kind of what it does. So what we might want to do is, as this record's going in, we might want to stamp the identity of the user onto that record as it goes in. And we can do that. Um, we can change the script. Uh, let's just see if we can get one. <coughs> so what we'll do, let's just reformat this. So as the record goes in, I'm just going to do a little log so we can just see what's been inserted. And then I'm going to grab the user object that comes in, and if that has a user ID, I'm stamping that onto the item. Because this is a JavaScript object, I can just dynamically add um, properties to it at runtime. And then because, coming back to the gentleman's point at the back of the room a minute or two ago, because we've got dynamic schema turned on, we will just magically add a new user ID column to that table and put that into that column. So is user always uh, got a value in it, then, even if you haven't set up for authentication? Um, it will, there's another property on user called, I think it's called level or user level, which will tell you, is the user anonymous? Are they authenticated? Oh, okay. So there's something called, I think it's called user level. Um, so you can actually ask, are they authenticated or not? Yeah, I didn't know if it came as uh, undefined or now. Or no, no, it'll, there will be an object there, yeah. 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 Um, I'm just adding one of the column magically on the server side. Um, what I want to do, just a little bit later on, is let's say you publish some talks, you do 10 talks, and they start to get some ratings coming in. But you might want to know that one of your talks is getting quite a lot of ratings recently. 
know, you've had a thousand ratings, but in the last five minutes you've had a hundred new ones. That's quite exciting. You might want to know about that. So I've got this notion of a new ratings count. How many ratings have we had recently? That's, that's kind of it. So I'm just adding that on the server side as well. Dynamics, uh, dynamic schema will kick in again. Okay, so let's save that script. So let's just go save that. Um, uh -huh. Pushes that back up to the cloud. As I said before, you can link these with source control, so rather than doing it this way, you can just have it come out to source control. And let's go back up. What do I want to do? Let's go back to our, our table here. And let's try and add another record. So we'll have this one called, for my convenience, we'll have this one called Fred. Let's just create that. Feels a little bit scarily slow. No, Fred's, Fred's got created, and let's create one called Ginger as well. Mm, okay, so I'm starting to get a bit worried about my network, but it's, it's there, it's there. So we've got Fred and Ginger. If we go back up to our table and have a quick look at that thing, where's our table? Uh, so, data, table. We should notice that we've probably grown a couple of new columns on the table. Um, there's the user ID. There's my token from Google up there. There's the new ratings count. There's the zero that we just inserted into it. So we got those new columns on that table. Just to finish off that story, of course, when we query the data, we only want to get the data that's actually our data. We're still getting somebody else's data. So what we could do is change the read script. Let's go back over to Visual Studio. Let's go to the read script. Sorry. At some point, set up the Google ID. Mm. So if you wanted people to sort on Twitter and Google and find the same tools, you'd have to sort of do some code yourself. Yes, you would. managing your own ID. Yes, you would. You need, you need a table for IDs at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, And you probably should have one anyway. Just sticking with one table makes this, makes this a lot simpler for, for sort of showing this. But yes. Yeah. Um, so in the read script, you get past the query that the user's doing, which is quite an interesting object, the user and the request, and again, it's just doing a, a request. So I'm going to replace this script as well. So let's, let's do a slightly more script here, but not too complicated, I don't think. So what we're doing is we're saying, OK, we get the query, and I've, this is an interesting way of doing things if, you, if you've not seen something like this before. Um, we add a where clause to the query using JavaScript with a JavaScript object that says, hey, I only want the records where the user ID matches the user ID that's coming in on the wire. And something somewhere takes that JavaScript object and turns it into SQL with a where clause on it, which is a nice bit of magic in my opinion. Um, then we execute the request, but unlike the last time, we don't just do the default behavior. We can plug in functions for what to do with success results and what to do with an error result. So on success of that read, I'm getting the results, and then I'm going through each one of those results, and off that JavaScript object, I'm deleting the user ID and the new ratings count. And this is just me being a bit um, OCD, really, but what I'm saying really is, hey, these things matter on the server, but I don't see why the client needs to know about this, so I'm going to take them off the objects before they go back down the wire. It saves me a little bit on the wire, but it also there's just some kind of encapsulation in there for me of, well, why am I sending you stuff you don't need? So I'm not going to send that to you, I'm just going to take that off. Um, it might cost you more CPU cycles on the server, it saves you bandwidth on the wire, I don't know, but I just felt like a nice thing to do. And then we send the response back there. So we can save that script, let's just go save that guy back to the server. So when you when you remove those fields, could you not do that from the query select or, or is it? Yes. Not? Yeah, could not put them on in the select. Yeah. yeah, that would be probably a better way of doing it actually. Yeah, we can do that. So now we're only reading our data. We're only getting the talks that actually belong to me, and not the ones I created when I wasn't authenticated. So that's nice. The the problem I create for myself here is that if I now want to say to you, hey, I've got this new talk called Fred and you came to it and you thought it was rubbish, um, would you like to rate it? 
I've made that rather difficult <laughs> because you've got to do an OAuth authentication, you've got to construct a JSON payload, and you've got to HTTP post it to this endpoint. Now, if I was to say to you as attendees to this session, that's what you've got to do to rate the session, I know what will happen. I won't get any rating on that session whatsoever because you say, well, that's ridiculous, I'm not doing that. So it would be nice if I could create some other way of doing this without giving you direct access to the tables. And I can do that. We have a notion of a thing called a custom API. And so you can't create one of these from Visual Studio. You've got to go into the portal, I think. So in the portal, we can create a custom API. So here's a custom API. And we can call it whatever we want. I'm going to call this one rate session because that's what I decided I should call it. And again, these are permissioned, but just for the purposes of what we're doing here, I'm just going to relax this permission just so I can show you what this does. I'm also going to subvert an HTTP GET um, just because it's easier for me to show you kind of how that works. I'm going to be a bit naughty and just use a GET where I shouldn't use a GET. But you, hopefully you'll forgive me for that. And so we're going to do an HTTP GET. So we create a custom API. Now even if you don't want to use the table stuff I've shown you, this is still an incredibly quick and easy way of creating a custom API on the web. And because what we do if we wander in here is you'll see that there's a bit of script. Let's focus on the get because we don't care about the post. So here's a script, takes a request, generates a response, and right now it just says hello world down the response stream. And if we save that script, And go back to um, PowerShell's kicking around somewhere. Somewhere in here, probably. Oh, there we go. So that new API is going to hang out at service.geomobile.net slash API slash rate session. And so if we invoke that and do an HTTP get on it, <coughs> somewhere in there, spin up a service and an endpoint doing something, you know, returning the date and time, whatever you want, if you want to quick, make a quick demo or something, you can spin that up very, very, very quickly. It's very, very easy. And we would, of course, want our API to actually rate the session. So let's go back and change this script. Let's get rid of this. And I think I've got this script. Oh, what have I just done? Oh, there we go. I think I've got this piece of script written somewhere. Let me just find it. Let's go to my desktop. Uh, Let me just paste this guy in. A bit more script, but it's not, it's not particularly complicated. Um, so we've got the request. I look into the query string for the title of the talk you're trying to rate, the rating value that you're trying to give it. And then one of the reasons really for showing you this is I'm building a piece of SQL. So we're going to update that table. We're going to increase the rating score increment the rating count, increment the new ratings count for that particular session. I am assuming that session titles are unique. Obviously they wouldn't be, but it doesn't, it's, it's just a demo. And then we use request.service.msql. MSQL is a, is a node module, so we're bringing in an MSQL to talk directly to the database. That's one mechanism we can use to execute SQL or store procedures. We could execute store procedures this way as well. And then we just say, great, we've got that in the database. So if we were to save that script, then we should have if we go back to maybe PowerShell, I've probably got a little bit yeah, okay, so here's something where we're taking that URL, the, the, the talk called Fred giving it a rating of 5, so if we go and invoke that, we should be adding to the ratings now for that particular tool. You can clearly feel every time we change the service and hit it, there's a little startup time every time we do it. Let's just invoke that a few times, once, twice, three times, four times. And so if we go back to the client, and refresh, we would hope to see that there's a score of 5 and it's been rated four times, so we're actually hitting that table. 
And what I might like to do, I think we talked about this earlier on, is I might like to, as somebody's rating the session actively like this, I might like to know about it. So I might like to get something like a push notification down to the device to tell me your session's been rated quite clear. I don't know, has anyone set up push notifications for any of these platforms, or iOS, or Android, or Windows, or... It, it's a little bit painful, generally speaking. Um, I'll give you a picture of how this works on, on Windows. Um, we have support for all of them, so we have support for Windows and Windows Phone, because maybe it surprises you, maybe it doesn't, they're actually different systems, they shouldn't be, but they are. Um, iOS and Android we support as well. There's a push module on the server, just like we use that MS SQL module, there's a push module. You do require some amount of registration. Um, whoever's push notifications you're trying to do, you will involve yourself in some, in some registration. There's no way around that. Um, the way we're going to do it here is, is typically um, sort of for smaller scale kind of scenarios. We also have this thing at Azure called notification hubs which is about sending hundreds of thousands of notifications. You can call that from a mobile service, but it's just an extra bit of kit. The way this works on Windows, if you haven't seen it before, and it's, it's the same kind of scenario for everybody, to be honest. The way this works on Windows is that you have your app. We have a cloud service called the Windows Notification Service, or WNS. Um, there's your mobile service. The way it works is on the device, you have to make an API call to get a unique URI. And what that URI represents on Windows is a notification surface for the app, for the user, for the device. So if you look at something like Windows 8, an app can have, say, five tiles on your home screen, and each one of those can receive cloud notifications. So what you have to know about is the unique ID for that tile for that app, for that user, for that device. So you make an API call saying, give me a URI, and we give you this big ugly URI. And that's how the cloud service will be able to talk back to you. So what you do with it is you get it, and you typically stick it into a table in your mobile service. And at some point later on, you decide you want to notify that device of something. You want to notify that user on that surface of something. Um, you know, like the football team score, or the lottery's win, or whatever it might be. So what you then do is you authenticate with the WNS service and you say, hey, send this notification to this URI, please. And we do the bit to actually get it down onto the device. If you have to put these pieces in place yourself, it's, it's a bit tedious. Um, I'll show you how we do it with mobile services and you can kind of decide yourself how, how tedious it is or isn't. Um, let's go back over to Visual Studio. Which is Visual Studio? That one. So again, I'm showing you the, the sort of most automatic way of doing this. There are other ways of doing it. This is the most automatic way of doing it in here. So what we can do is um, we can go to this, uh, this project again, and we can add a push notification. This is a, one of the sort of biggest pieces of Visual Studio wizardry I've seen in a while. Um, it's one of these wizards that pops up and says, oh, you want to do a push notification. So, you spend a long time reading this screen before you click next. And the first thing that you, have, you might not be aware of, if you want to use push notifications from something like Windows 8 or Windows Phone, you have to have your app registered in the Windows 8 store. It's just something you have to do. Um, this wizard does it for you. It doesn't mean that you ever have to ship the app through the store. You can delete it afterwards if you're just playing around. But you have to put it in the store, or else it won't let you talk to our cloud service. So I hear I'm signing into the store, and I've just about realized what's about to happen, or there might be. I would suspect it's going to send me a text message. Bear with me. This is two factor authentication at what's um, it? You've got a signal, You've got a text, fantastic. Five, four, seven, six, two, six. So this is me logging into my developer account at the Windows Store first and foremost. Okay, so we should be on there. So it goes and checks my developer account at the Windows Store and says, 
Have you got any apps at the Windows Store that you want to associate this with? I'm going to say no, I'm going to create a new app, so I'll call this MT Talks app. We'll reserve that name globally in the Windows Store for my app, hopefully. Great, and then I can select that app. What that actually does is it creates an entry at the Windows Store, it creates some magic GUID identifiers for that thing, and it copies those down into this application project, such that what I'm working on here now has an identity in the Windows Store. I don't know how that works. Then it says, which mobile service are we playing with? We said this one. Did I click that button? And then it says, I'm going to do some stuff. And I'll say, OK. table for us at mobile services. So if we go back to the server explorer and refresh this, it created a new table called channels for us. This is where we can store the channel URIs for our push notification. So it just did that for us. You don't have to use it, but, but it does this for you by default. What it also did on that, um, on that table was it generated an insert script. <coughs> um, this bit we don't need, don't worry about that, it's just an example. This bit we don't need, it's just an example. But what it did, it's a bit of a weird one this, the insert script, we're inserting a channel now into this table, it actually reads the own, its table itself, it reads its own table, looking for any installations that match the installation we're sending up. An installation ID is kind of a unique identifier, if you like, for this app on this device. That's what we're trying to do. And if it doesn't find any records, it just does the insert. But if it does find records, it checks to see, is the new channel URI different from the one we've already got registered? If it does, it does an update. If, it do, if it's not, it doesn't do anything. So it's just trying to avoid duplicates. Yeah? Okay, great. Right. Save that. <coughs> oh, actually, no. Save that. <coughs> I want to do one more thing with that insert script. Sorry, I've just made a mess of that. I want to do one more thing. Because of the way we're working, I want to say item.userid equals user.userid. Or maybe just, this shouldn't happen, in fact. Or anonymous. Let's save that. The other thing I just need to do with that table is I think it sets up the permissions um, incorrectly for me. So let me just make sure that saves. And then we just go to that table, edit its permissions, and I'm going to require authenticated users. So the other thing that that wizard did, it did two more things. It, it hacks your code a little bit again. And one thing it does is if we go back to our app class, it adds another proxy onto the app class, which can fox you for quite a while because you can end up with two proxies in your app. One might be logged in, one might <coughs> not, and it gets all hell breaks loose. So what you need to do in this case is get rid of that. We don't need that. That's just extra. It was trying to be helpful, but it didn't help in this particular case. And the other thing it does is it generates this little class for you over here, which is kind of handy, I think, for a demo at least, with a method called upload channel on it. Let me just shorten some of these name choices for you because they're quite long. Uh, that will kind of do, I think. And this is the proxy over here. So what's this doing? Um, this is like the longest API call in Windows, as far as I know. Create me a push channel push notification channel for application async means 
get me that URI for the application's main notification um, for toasts, tiles, and badges, and it gives you a big URI. You can also call a second URI saying for the second tile, for the third tile, for the fourth tile, but this is the main one. That's going to give us a URI. Then they do a bit of jiggery pokery to work out a unique installation ID. Then they create a JavaScript object, slam a channel URI value on it, slam an installation ID on it, and they insert that into that table in the cloud. So they're using that visually um, typed API that I talked about earlier on. So what we need to do is make sure that we call this API. So if we go over here somewhere, um, we've got our cloud service access. Somewhere this has got a registered push notifications method on it. And we could say, um, I don't know what that thing's called. Upload channel. I'll give you the idea. So if we press F5 on this, unless I've made a mess, what we would hope to see is that if we log in, register for push notifications, we should be making that API call, sending that thing up to that cloud table, and so ideally when we wander back over to our portal and have a look at the data, and have a look at the channels table, I'm hoping that we've got a record in there with our URI for cloud noti push notifications and our user ID stamped on it. Does that make sense? Cool. The last thing we need to do is we need a bit of something somewhere which reads through all the talks, finds the ones that have been rated recently, and sends a push notification. And this is where something like our scheduling capability comes in. We have the ability to run a script every so often, and that's kind of handy. So what I could do is go over to the schedule here and create a scheduled piece of work. We'll call this Notify. And I'll say, I want to... You can do that in Visual Studio as well. No, you can't create a scheduler in Visual Studio. You can only do it here in the portal. There's a bit of a... It, it would be nice if all these things were mirrored into Visual Studio. I guess at some point they might be. Um, but I don't think you can create one of these there just yet. Um, you can have one of these scripts that just runs on demand. If you had a, a little app, and you know, once a day you want to go and have a look at something and reset a few things, you can just run the script manually. But let's make this one run every minute. And then let's just edit the script for this. Mm -hmm. And I've got this piece of script already, already sort of kicking around somewhere. Um, let me just send this one. Uh -huh. And let me just paste this thing in. So there's a little bit more scripting here, but hopefully not too much. Um, what happens every minute in this case? We're going to get hold of that conference talk table where we've got more than five new ratings on any of the talks. So we just say, hey, if they've been rated five, well, six times, we want to know about it. We get all those records. We get the results. And this is a bit of my sort of hacking around JavaScript, so you might see a much better way of doing this. What I do is I go through every result, I reset the new ratings count back to zero and update the table, so that's updated. We could obviously do that in one update statement potentially, but we're doing it here. And then what I do is I build up a little map. So for each user who has talks with more than five new ratings, I build a map from the user ID to an array, if you like, of their talks that they need to be notified about. So you've, you've made 10 talks, two have got more than five new ratings, so I build a little map that I'm going to iterate through. So this is the map per user ID, initially empty, and then we add the talks onto the end of it. And then we call this function with that map to say, right, let's notify those people. So what I do in this particular function, we go through each user in the map, we go to the channels table and say, well, we need to find out where we are going to notify them. So sorry, we find the channels table for that particular user. We get those results and we call this handler. And 
finally, what does that handler do? It says, okay, we kind of assume that a user will only have one channel because we've got that script that tries to make sure things are unique. So we just take the first channel. And then for every talk we need to tell them about, we find the use push dot Windows notification service, because we're using Windows here, we've got other options here for Apple and Google. And I'm sending a toast notification down to that device, just telling them, hey, this talk has had some new ratings. So let's save that. I know there's quite a lot of script there, I'm not really unpicking all of it. Um, it takes a bit longer to write than it takes to point out with the maps, but it's quite. Is there an abstraction for if you're trying to send notifications to multiple devices? So you yeah, multiple you devices the of different types? Yeah. No, you, you'd have to switch so around and. Yeah. yeah. And it's because I think the problem with that is if we go down that route, you end up losing the unique capabilities that the vendors have got on their devices, including us. You know, so we've got things like tile notifications at, at four different sizes. Um, if, we, uh, if we went down to the common denominator, we'd probably have to lose that because no one else does that. And I, I can imagine we wouldn't want to lose that. I suppose you could build an abstraction yourself that took the commonality and, and did it. So how would you determine which device it is from the table? So if it's an Android or Windows or whatever. Ah, so there's no, no, there's no magic way of knowing just from, we don't tell you on the server side this was an Android device, you would have to send something up there to say. You could probably actually, I would guess from the URI you've got, you could probably infer it. Because our URIs are not like their URIs, so you could probably infer it, but... You've got to do it when you register a channel anyway. You've got to send the message up there. Exactly. You've got to send the channel URI to the table. So you could either include explicitly this was Android, or you could try and figure it out on the service side by looking at the registration entry. But I'd probably send it explicitly. Each app, presumably, would be from a different store than a different app. Would be native? So I think at the moment, if I remember rightly, look where we are, let's have a quick look. Are we logged in? I think we might be. Logged in. Just messing with the service again. There we go. So this thing, Fred has been rated four times. So what we would hope is that if we rate Fred a couple more times, let's rate five and six, I would hope that within a minute or so, that script should be running up there, should be push notifying down to here with the toast notification, and um, within a minute or so. <laughs> and be optimistic about that. I don't think you started the process, I think it's disabled. Ah, you're absolutely right, thank you. What you need to remember to do is enable that script. <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> within a minute or two, it's possible now that... <laughs> yes, yeah, so always remember to enable your script. There was a big thing on the screen, wasn't it, saying, this job will not run. <laughs> well, I was too dumb to read that. So possibly now, within a minute, <laughs> we might see a push notification come down from that thing, saying, hey, your talk, Fred, has got some ratings. You have to write that script in JavaScript. Is that because the back end is in the... Because the back end is in, is in JavaScript. So if you're using a back end... Dot net, would that be I, I'm, not I'm not 100% sure on, on scheduled scripts, so I'd have to check on that for, for .NET, because the, the, their bits are still in preview, so it's hard to say definitively yet what, what will or won't be there. I, I, I suspect at the moment you'd have to write that script in JavaScript. I've not seen any push notes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Just as I was starting to doubt, we get a push notification. So it's now got six ratings. If we rated a few more times, so let's just actually I can do it this way. So another one, two, three, four, five, six. We may at some point get another push notification saying it's now been rated what twelve times or something like that. But you get the idea as to how that stuff works. Cool. Let's pop back in for the review. Alright, so hopefully that's given you quite a flavour of some of the things that we can do. Um, what have we played around with? We played around setting up a service, um, making HTTP RESTful calls to it, um, getting data in there, getting authentication on there, getting a bit of authorization on there to some extent, getting uh, scheduled scripts, getting push notifications. And if you've ever set, I know you perhaps haven't done this, if you've ever gone through setting up push notifications, even just for Windows, 
it is quite tedious, and actually being able to do it that way does make things quite a lot quicker. Um, I'm not going to spend a long time on this, it's not really my thing, but there are prices to be paid for using this stuff. We slashed prices on Windows Azure, I think, the day before yesterday, the, on Microsoft Azure. We changed its name the day before that. God, it's hard to keep up. Um, we slashed prices on Microsoft Azure yesterday. I don't know whether mobile services has changed its pricing. I looked this morning, and it seems to be the same as when I copied this off the web the other day. Fundamentally, you can run for free if you can fit into the buckets that that, that limitations that they give you on the free service. You can run for free and still have a paid for database. That's fine, there's no problem with that. You can have a big database that you're paying for and still run mobile services for free. But they give you up to 10 services. There's some legal definition of what API calls means and it's 500,000 API calls. There's some definition of what active devices means and it's 500 active devices. Um, is it, sorry, you say the API calls, is that per day, per week, per month? Th there is some definition of what, I'm not going to try and spiel it out for you because it was obviously written by a lawyer, so you should probably read it and then try and get it. Because they actually, they had an initial definition of what they meant by this and then they changed it, so the best thing for me to say is, is have a look. All you have to do is go to Windows as your pricing mobile and you'll get this table. Um, with all the definitions. Do, do we need to solicit it to understand? I would that? advise that you do read it with independence. <laughs> actually, do you know what? That's, um, that's actually true. So if, if you work at a company like, you know, work in a big company, you probably know this. Um, a company like Microsoft, whenever there's a legal definition, we always say, we can't interpret what that means to you. You have to sit there with your lawyer if you want to interpret it as to what it means. I can't tell you what it means. I don't know. Read it with your lawyer. So strictly speaking, yes. Yes, you should. Anyway, that's the simple thing for somebody like me who doesn't really understand pricing or law. There's a free version, there's a basic version, and there's a standard version. And the fundamentals are, on the free version, you're running on a, a server that you share with somebody else. You can't reserve a, a server instance. And as you move up the pricing tiers, you can have your own server and you can have multiple of those servers. And then there's some other bits that you, that you pay for. But, I stop kind of at the technology and leave you to figure out exactly how you pay for the stuff. And, and that's pretty much it. Um, go to Azure, you can try this stuff out. There's a whole bunch, actually, just to say, there's a whole bunch of really nice tutorials. If you go to windowsazure.com slash mobile, you can find tutorials as how to do all that stuff we just did for Windows, Windows Phone, iOS, and Android. I don't know if they've yet added PhoneGap and Xamarin, but they probably have. They've only put those in recently. And there's nice little walkthroughs of do this, do that. Go to Google and register like this. Go to Twitter and register like this. We break it all down. It's quite nice. Um, I just say thanks a lot for, for staying along. We did manage to use the whole 90 minutes in the end. Um, I hope, did you find it useful? Was it, was it a good view of, of what, things, what things are and what we've got? Is it the sort of thing that you might have a play with? You might try it out? Cool. Okay, well, that's good from my point of view. Uh, feel free to drop me a line anytime. Feel free to catch me around here if you see me wandering around, or feel free to send stuff on Twitter, um, whatever you want to do. And enjoy the rest of today. And are you here tomorrow again? And everyone here on the last day as well for the workshop? Okay, so awesome. All right, cool. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming.